and a very good day to you and welcome to the program. We want to look back and see how God has brought us through the year 2020. We want to reflect on the good and the hard times. We want you to join us on this journey and we trust that by the end of this journey, you too will be able to say, I'm waiting for the year 2021. Enjoy the program. Israel was amazing. That was the biggest tour group I've ever taken in my life. And it was intense. And we are still receiving some of the benefits, the fruit. You know, there's people that couldn't have babies who are now pregnant. I think a lot of marriages were strengthened. And most of all, through that whole tour, including myself, um, we drew much closer to the Lord Jesus Christ and to His Holy Word. And that is probably the highlight. Yes, we laughed a lot and we had fun, but I think it was a very serious, godly, intimate, spiritual journey. And of course, what better place than Israel itself, and especially the old city. The Bible just came alive. When I came home, I was pleasantly exhausted. <laughs> because as the, the event uh, carried on, the people were, were, were receiving and wanting more. And, uh, you know, and all the glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the more they were receptive, the more I was preaching and the more the Holy Spirit was working. So it was a wonderful, wonderful trip that we will never forget, will we? I think it's what God is, the way God has constructed us. But that intimate relationship that we were having with the team, with the, with the group, and we were talking about over 200 people. Eh? And um, it, it was so refreshing for me. And I wonder if there's something wrong with me sometimes, because I don't know if that affects other people the same way. So for me, intimate personal contact is my food. You know, Jill will tell, will tell you, my wife Jill will tell you, she, she can sit by herself, she's an intercessor for days. But I need, I need to relate to people, and especially about Jesus. And so that's what keeps me going, is preaching the gospel. I've never been so excited in my life as what I am now. I really mean that with all my heart. So that uh, trip to Israel really cemented the fact that um, God has called us not to be isolated. He never designed us to be like Lone Rangers. He, he, he designed us to be together. You know, we're also cattle farmers. You won't see a cow standing in a field by itself. If it is, that cow is sick, or there's something seriously wrong. It's either giving birth or it's broken a leg. Cattle move in herds. People need each other. And this um, horrific uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, has been instrumental in dividing people. Closing churches, people are too scared to speak to each other, too scared to meet each other, even families. And I mean, as we're facing the Christmas, New Year season, it's going to be a bittersweet time because there are people that cannot get home because there's no, there's no planes available. There are others that are going to be locked into confinement. You know, I'm thinking of somebody on the 14th floor in a flat and uh, the flat can only take two or three people and there's 10 people in that flat and there's going to be sparks flying. And that's where Jesus Christ needs to come in. So, so I was invited to Bloemfontein to be a speaker at the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast. Uh, we had the privilege of uh, also meeting the ambassador for Israel to South Africa. He was there. Um, there were delegates from all over the world, from USA, Texas. Um, there were delegates from many African countries and obviously South Africa. We also had parliamentarians there from our government. And it was an amazing time that we had. And we preached our hearts out, and people were healed and uh, recommitted their lives. And then we came home. And then, <laughs> and then the game started. And it ain't no game, let me tell you. Because the next thing we heard was that um, people at that conference had, had uh, got the coronavirus. 
and the news were insinuating they had brought it in from outside. I'm not going to go there because I'm not a doctor. But a, a very uh, stressful time ensued with my wife Jill and I. You see, what had happened was we'd come home and my daughter had phoned me and said, Dad, you know that you're in the newspapers again. <laughs> That's not always for good. They are saying that um, you have um, been to a meeting where the coronavirus was present. And the reporter wanted to speak to me and my daughter wouldn't allow him to. And he wanted to know, has Uncle Angus taken the test? Because he's a father in the nation. He's a responsible man. He's just come from a conference where people have been diagnosed with the coronavirus. She said, Dad, you better get the test done. Now, I didn't know anything about this. Remember, I live on a farm. So Jill and I immediately went down to Peter Maritzburg, the city near us, and we got the test done. And the test was positive. Anyway, that was the start of, of self-isolation, not for two weeks, 67 days to be exact, and five tests, four positive and the last one negative. But that was a turning point, I think, in my life because we weren't even allowed to see our grandchildren, no one, no one at all. Fortunately, praise God, we live in a house on a farm. We don't live in a flat on the 14th floor. But that was a time where this book became a reality to me. I spent 67 days in the Word. Now they phoned me from different radio stations and said, how are you coping? I said, very well. Do you have any symptoms? No symptoms. No symptoms? No symptoms. How are you doing it? How are you keeping yourself up? I said, through the Word of God, this Bible. What you must understand is that I live on a farm. And our farms are, are, are together. My boys are farming. I don't farm anymore. So I've got the one son who is farming across the road. He's farming with a large staff. He does strawberries and kiwi fruit. So now when my wife and I were declared positive, the whole farm, the whole farming community, and then my, my son where I'm living now, he's got staff, and then I've got a daughter across the road with her husband's got another farm. All of them were involved. And of course, you know what the news is like. They made, they made meat of it, and they really climbed into it. And so they had to um, take precautions with their staff. And fortunately, and my whole family was tested. Not one of them was positive. <laughs> So I praise God for that. Because if they had been positive, they would have shut down this whole farm. Now, you know, you can't just shut a farm down. You've got cows that you've got to milk. You've got strawberries you've got to pick. You've got to pick cabbages. You've got to, you know, you've got to carry on. It's a, it's a, it's a living organism. So like an office in town where you just close the front door and walk away. You see, so we've got nowhere to go. So God was very gracious there. But the tension through all this, not just on me, on my children, and my grandchildren, actually, was intense. I must be honest with you, after the third test, my wife Jill started taking some strain. She woke up the one morning in tears, and she said to me, Angus, how long is this going to go on for? And then, of course, we had the, the final clearance. So, you know, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord, and are called according to His purposes. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. So out of that, I believe that I matured in the Lord. And I realized the Holy Spirit showed me too just how the devil is playing with the whole world, not just with South Africa. And the, the, main, the main weapon of the evil one is fear. And the opposite to fear is faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. And that is exactly what happened. I really want to say to my friends and my faithful viewers be careful that you don't allow the lies of the devil to rob you of your joy and your strength be very careful because that's what it is the lord says in john 10 10 the thief comes to kill to steal and to destroy but jesus said i came to give you life abundantly and i want to qualify on that point just in case somebody thinks that i'm being rebellious Against the government? Not at all. We conform to what the government says. Government says we wear masks, we wear masks. 
The government says we mustn't go all over the place. We don't do that. But we will not, we will not allow fear and depression and anxiety and stress to rob us. The National Coronavirus Command Council has decided to enforce a nationwide lockdown. lockdown. Yeah, so, you know, through this, it wasn't just a case of our farm or our country. I mean, there's elections taking place in the United States of America. And I believe COVID-19 has had a lot to do with upsetting everything in, in the States. There's been elections in the UK. And the same thing applies there, all over the world. So it was an absolute debacle. And then one morning, I woke up and I believe it was the Holy Spirit. Because that's how it's been for my 41 years of ministry. Not some prophet from somewhere else, no, the Holy Spirit in my heart. He said to me, Angus, send out a two minute or three minute thought for the day. I realized that my crew couldn't come up from Durban and they are the best in the West and I have been totally biased, but they are, they're amazing men and they've been with me for 16 years. They know every nook and cranny of this farm. All our programs are shot outside. Mostly. We've now got a recording studio as well. And so what do I do? Well, then I remember the story of Moses. When the Lord said, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And Moses said, but I've got nothing. And the Lord said, what do you got in your hand? And he said, I've got a stick. He said, use it. So the Lord's saying to me, what have you got in your hand? I said, I've got a cell phone. And he said, use it. So I got hold of my producer, George Carpenter. I said, George, God's laid something on my heart. I need to send out a thought for the day every single morning at about half past five South African time. And I thought it would just be for maybe a couple of dozen people. Well, you know, the end of the story is it's gone viral right around the earth. Hey, very good morning to you. It is the 29th of December, 2020. And this is your friend Angus Bucken with a thought for the day. And that's what I started doing. Now, I think as we sit here today, we're pushing, what, 260 thoughts for the day, and we haven't missed one single day, and it's been tough. It really has, because some mornings I wake up and I, I've got nothing there. But, you know, praise God for quiet time. I, I'm a man who has a good quiet time. I have a quiet time from 4 o'clock until 9 o'clock every day. I'm privileged I can do that. I couldn't do that when I was actively farming, but five hours. And I remember John Wesley saying to his preachers, if you can't spend five hours a day, in the Word and spending time with the Lord, change your trade. <laughs> and I understand why. Because I've got 41 years of stories to tell. Because you can't tell the same story twice. And every single morning, the Lord has given me a thought for the day which I've conveyed. And it has gone absolutely viral right around the globe. I am getting responses from places like Northern Spain. I've never been to Spain in my life before. From South America, from, from Europe, from the States, from Canada, from Australia, New Zealand, everywhere. And it's multiplying every single day. And if we're five minutes late, <laughs> it's panic stations. And I, you know, all the glory to Jesus, I haven't changed. I'm still speaking the same way I've always spoken. Telling the same stories I've always told. What has changed? I'll tell you what's changed. The climate has changed. That's what's changed. And every single morning, it's like fresh bread out of the oven. I, even myself, I don't know what I'm going to speak about. When I wake up at four o'clock, that's my time. I get up and I make Jill a cup of tea after we've prayed for the family. And I've told her that I love her. Then I go into my prayer room and I say, Lord, here I am. And I have got no idea. <laughs> and this is God's honest truth. I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. And I open my Bible. I read through my Bible systematically. And then it's almost like a bell rings. And the Lord says, this is what you're going to speak about today. People are requiring encouragement in the area of faith or maybe hope or maybe holiness or repentance, and then he gives me an illustration every single time with the scripture. And that is the start. And then of course, grassroots and family time, 
and our newsletters and our Facebook page and all the others are just doubling up all the time because people cannot go anywhere. And so what, instead of us sitting back in our corner and crying over spilt milk, we are going for it. And I have never been so excited in my life as what I am at present. If I had to live my life again, I wouldn't spend so much time in preparation. I'd spend more time in prayer and hearing the voice of God. You know, one of our standard comments on this program is a good idea is not always a God idea. And a need does not justify a call. You've got to do what God tells you to do. Lots of young men come to me and they say, you know, how do you do it? And I say, listen to God. Because when I went to that Mkuzi Game Reserve, which is just north of us, to have a rest, I was exhausted again. Okay? I was booked to go all over the world. And I got a clear word from the Lord. We all know the story in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. I have this against you. I mean, I was shattered. I thought God was going to pat me on the back. You've forsaken your first love. Repent. Stop it. Otherwise, I'm going to take the candlestick away. What's the candlestick's light? Holy Spirit, away from you. So I repented. I canceled all my programs. And then I said, okay, Lord, what do I do? He said, I want you to mentor young men. And I thought maybe half a dozen. And that was the birth of the phenomenon. I'm calling it a phenomenon of mighty men, which has gone right around the globe. So the bottom line is, do what he tells you to do. Don't try and help God. He doesn't need your help. He needs your obedience. Sent out a little email, one-liner, and 240 men arrived. That blew me away. <laughs> For, and, we fed, and we fed them. And the next thing, I mean, it was, you know, you were here, George, in 2010. We don't know how many men, so we don't want to, to say because we never sold tickets and we never took a collection. But there was hundreds of thousands of men here. And I don't know if that'll ever be done again before the Lord comes because He's coming so soon and because society is changing the way it is. After the Mighty Men Conference in Jeffreys Bay on the eastern side of our country, where we had an amazing meeting, where the boys there really did their homework, um, everything was closed down. No more big meetings, because I mean there were over 7,000 men in that particular meeting. So what do we do now? Now the guys are writing to us and phoning us from all over the world. I'm talking about New Zealand. I'm talking about Australia. I'm talking about Canada. I'm talking about Alaska. And not to mention the USA. So what do we do? You know, I said, well, you carry on. But how can we carry on? We can't meet. Another miracle happened. The Lord laid on our hearts to do an online Mighty Men Conference. Wow, was that exciting. Well, the boys took it and they ran with it. It was like a bushfire. They advertised it right around the globe. The big day came. It was one of the highlights of my life. And yeah, the devil thinks he's closed us down. No, no, he's just magnified the enormity of the need for men to meet with men. Why? Because there are very few spiritual fathers in the world. That's the truth. And I'm not the only one, make no mistake. And young men need, they need uh, mentorship. They need examples. Remember what, um, what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's a tall order, but we should be able to say that. And I will never forget that event. You know, I sat there myself watching it live. And I was weeping myself at the presence of the Holy Spirit and the excellent job that the crew did. I must really commend them, especially my producer. But you know, I saw people afterwards on the media phoning in and saying, you pointed to me. I have not been able to have a baby for 10 years. I am now pregnant. And, I, and babies have been born from that event. Broken homes, broken marriages, um, businesses, been restored. It was, it was one of the highlights of the 41 years I've been preaching. And then after that, of course, we had individual Mighty Men conferences all over the world. God is on the move. And one thing I have learned, and this uh, lockdown has taught me, our God is not 
locked down. He is a living God. He is coming back soon and he's on the move. And he's looking for men and women who will move with him. Some people don't want to do anything different. It's always worked that way before. And that's how we're going to keep doing it. So I think in a way, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to phrase my words carefully, otherwise I'm going to get into trouble. But I think in a way, you know, the Bible says all things work together for the good. I think through the COVID that this virus has taught us that we need to be ready to change at a moment. Because when Jesus comes back, that's what's going to happen. It's not, a, it's not going to be a case of oh, we don't do it this way or we don't do it that way. Because this COVID-19 has changed the world forever. What has happened in 2020 has never happened since the foundation of the world. It never happened in the time of Adam and Eve. It's never happened in the time of David or even when Jesus walked on the earth. And this is what we have to contend with. And so I'm not uh, afraid. I'm not depressed. Tired maybe. <laughs> but I'm not depressed. Because there's a new door opened. You see, if we go to the Word of God in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8, this is what it says. The Lord says, I have seen your works. See? So the Lord's saying to you and I, I have seen that you have been faithful with little things. Now I'm going to make you faithful with other things. I've seen your work. I set before you an open door. You can't break the door down. If the door does not open, don't try and destroy the door. Okay? It's closed for a reason. The Lord does not want you to go through that door. Can you imagine what would have happened when I went up to the Mkuzi Game Reserve and the Lord said, I want you to cancel all your meetings. I said, no, no, Lord, I'm going to keep preaching the gospel. Well, people would have got saved and we would have had crowds because we had crowds before, but nothing like what was going to happen. When God does something, it's unprecedented. There's no man can um, make up something like that. Okay? And so the, the, the scripture goes like this. I said before you an open door that no man can close because... I see that you have little strength, but you have kept the faith and you have not denied my name. I want to stress that last part. It's so imperative in these last days that the name of Jesus Christ is put forward. Because everybody's talking about everything else. I hear some preachers and it, it saddens me. They've got an opportunity to speak to a large crowd of people and they never mention the name of Jesus Christ. They mention everybody else. You can do it. You can make it. You got it in you. That's okay. That's called motivational speaking. That's not preaching. Preaching is to tell people that Jesus Christ can overcome COVID-19. That's what the world wants to hear. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. If Jesus can heal a leper, a blind man, a lame man, and raise the dead, he can deal with COVID-19. Be it according to your faith. Is COVID-19 real? Yes, very much so. Have people died of COVID-19? Yes, it's documented. But people have also died of leprosy. And people have died of all kinds of diseases. But Jesus Christ needs to be elevated and lifted up. He says, if you lift me up, I will draw all men unto myself. And that's what we're doing. But we're doing it through social media now. I have not left this country this year. It's the first time in 41 years. I have not got an airplane and I've not flown anywhere. I, I stand to be corrected. I flew from Cape Town to, <laughs> to the farm because I had a meeting in Cape Town about a, a train that I want to speak to you about later. How can I be of any use to children at a time like this? Well, I want to tell you maybe this because of my age. You know, I have 11 grandchildren of my own. But wherever I go, I see children are the ones that support me. So I really mean that. I go to an airport, and you can come with me, and you'll see it. And I'm talking to my producer. He's been with me. Children run to me, and that makes me so happy. I would hate to be unapproachable. So children are very, very important to me, and especially at this lockdown time, because they are confused. Why am I going to wear this thing around my face all the time? 
Why can't I go and play with my friends? It makes me emotional, you know. And mother's trying to keep the mask on and he's trying to take it off. And then, of course, Snowy came on the scene. And by the way, Snowy's just outside. He's eating grass in the paddock. You know, my daughter, my youngest daughter, Jilly, I asked her a couple of years ago, I said, Jilly, if I had to write one more book before I died, what book would you suggest? She said, Dad, write a book for children. <laughs> I went and I sat at home and I believe the Holy Spirit showed me. I want Snowy, your horse, to tell the story. I said, well, that's, that's unique. I went to my publishers and I want to be honest with, with you and I love you, Chris. He said to me, it'll never work. I said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Snowy tells the story about what he's heard Angus preaching because Snowy's always with me. And those, those books, I've got three books now. Two are published, the third one's still to be published. Those books are going viral. And now my producer and his team have now put it on like the thought for the day. And I've got grown-ups who don't even have any children asking me, where is the snowy program for this week? Because I haven't got it yet. That is how God works. God takes nobodies and God takes nothing and He makes it into something exponential. He took two sardines and five barley loaves of bread and He fed 5,000 men, not including the women and the children. Now you're going to tell me that that little boy was the only child, the only person in that whole crowd that had any food. Of course he wasn't. The others just wouldn't part with theirs, you see. And there's a lesson for somebody listening to this program. You hang on to everything you got, you'll lose it. It'll go through your fingers. I'm telling you like sand. But when you start to sow everything you've got to God, God will multiply it. And that's exactly what happened. Snowy now is becoming a household name. Yesterday, a lady told me her little boy dresses up. He wears a cowboy hat. He wears boots. He wears a buckle. And he's got a Bible. <laughs> and he walks up and down outside shouting. Because obviously he thinks that uh, Snowy's boss shouts and he doesn't preach. I never dreamt in a million years that we would be narrating. First we wrote the book. Then I had to read the book. And then we put the cartoons with the book. I never dreamt that that would happen. You see, that's what God does. You know, faith begets faith. That's what John Wesley was told when he started preaching. There was a German, Peter Boller. He said, preach faith until you have it. And when you have it, you'll preach faith. And this whole ministry is a faith ministry. And the more we step out onto the water, the more the Lord meets us. And I wish I'd known that years ago. And I would have short-circuited what we're doing. So this little story called Snowy has opened a door for me with children all over the world. I've got cowboys all over the world, in India, in North Africa, in Europe, Australasia, they all know Snowy. And of course, during the lockdown, I've had lots of time to think and to read. I love reading books. Books are my favorite. I have a large library, and I love biographies and autobiographies especially. There's very few men and women of God that I haven't read about. And that little book, Faith Like Potatoes. I sat there with my youngest daughter. She's in charge of our books, Jilly. And I said, Jilly, maybe we need to do an upgrade, a revised edition of the flagship of the ministry called Faith Like Potatoes. And she agreed. And then I got a very lovely pencil drawing done by a lady by the name of Ruti van Amerva. She lives in the Karoo with her husband and her family. And that picture was sent to me and was framed. I took that picture and that was the cover of the book. Then we literally reprinted the book, which is now on sale. And I want to tell you something. One of the main reasons why we put that book back into a revised edition is because my wife Jill said to me, Angus, that book encourages people. Because that's a true life story. And people are very down at the moment. Some people have been hurt badly. Well, if you read my story, you'll see. I don't think you could be hurt any more worse than when I was hurt. And yet God redeemed me. And it talks about floods. It talks about droughts. 
It talks about fires. It talks about personal tragedy. And it talks about all those things. And that little book, which you can basically read in, an, in a night if you're a good reader, builds you up in the inner man. Why? Because that little book glorifies God and only God. And so the book is doing well. And we thank the Lord. We've got a devotional out this year, a brand new one. And we've got another diary. So things are carrying on. And there's maybe a word for one of our viewers right now. Don't give up. Jesus has never changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Things might have changed on this earth, but not him. And he's never, ever caught by surprise. He knew about the COVID-19 before he formed the earth. Maybe he's wanting to see how we're going to handle it. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. and I'm not going there. But I want to tell you, it's done me the world of good. It's made me have a good look at myself. Because there's areas in my life that I need to sharpen up on. And God made it possible for me to have that time. Because before that, I couldn't even think straight. I was just changing planes and going here and going there and going the next place, but never having a good look at myself. I have found through this COVID-19, I'm spending more time with my immediate family. Often my son, my one son will come to me, Dad, have you got five minutes? Yes, jump in the pickup. I want to show you some cattle. Then the other son will come over and he's quite bike. He came over yesterday and he'll sit down and tell me, I've got a few problems with my strawberries. And we pray about it. I've, I've been over there this morning. The rest of my family don't even know. I cycled over there on my bicycle and I prayed in front of all his staff that this uh, disease, this infection, this infestation will stop. So this COVID-19 has brought me back to my roots. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his family? Mark 8.36 says, loses his soul, which is his family. And so I, I choose to say that it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter where you don't go. What matters is your, is your relationship with the Son of God. Before this coronavirus broke out in 2020, it broke out here in South Africa around about, I think, the month of March, if I'm not mistaken. But before that, God gave me a very clear picture. He speaks to me through pictures in my heart. No audible talking. I've never heard God speak to me audibly. I never had the privilege. But He does speak to me through nature because I'm a farmer. He speaks to me through other people. He confirms it mainly through this book, the Bible. Okay. And I went away for a bit of a rest with my wife. And my, son, my oldest son, Andy, said, Dad, he's the organizer. He's organized all the major events in this ministry. He said, Dad, God's going to show you something unique when you have this rest. And I'm being honest with you now. Please hear my heart. Okay, what you see is what you get. I thought, Lord, something new. <laughs> being very arrogant. Something new. We've done all the major stadiums in this country and a lot over the overseas. We've got two major feature films. We're on television every single day of the week. We've written many, many books. We've had the biggest prayer meetings in the country. What is new? And sure as anything, God did exactly what my son said he would do. He showed me a new season. He said, in the past, Angus, you've always been calling people to come to the farm or come to a stadium or come to an open air meeting. The people have had to travel. This time, they're not going to travel. You're going to travel. How am I going to do this, Lord? He said, a train. In Zulu, we say, Istimela, a steam train. And that train is going to start in Cape Town. And it's going to go right through this nation, South Africa, up to Musina, which is the border. And by the way, <laughs> how long is a piece of string? How big is God? You know, you know what, what us evangelists are like? I'm already moving on to the next vision, and these guys are trying to catch up with me. I'm saying, but there's a bridge that goes across the Lumpapa River into Zimbabwe. And a train can go across that bridge as well. <laughs> and then there's another bridge that goes across the mighty Zambezi River at the Victoria Falls. So what's to stop us going to Cairo? Nothing at all. So we're going to start in Cape Town in a couple of months time. Everybody's going to come on board. They're going to pay for their ticket. They'll get three square meals a day. They'll get beautiful accommodation. Everything will be laid on. 
Can you imagine this train steaming into a country town, a town that gets overlooked every time a major speaker comes to South Africa because they can't get there and they can't afford it, into a township where poor people live? It will be well advertised in advance. We'll have some of the top bands, gospel bands, in the country on board. We'll have a flatbed coach at the back of the train with a permanent structure on it with floodlights, generator, sound system, everything in place. When we steam into that town, everybody off. Not a case of a one-man show, come and watch or listen to Uncle Angus, no. They'll go into that town and they will saturate that town. I'm talking about revival. A people saturated with God. They'll go into the schools, into the prisons, into the hospitals, into the old age homes, down the streets, into the townships, wherever they can go. They will go with material, Christian material. We'll be giving out um, booklets on salvation. They'll be praying for the sick themselves, the passengers. In the evening, they'll come back to the station. The whole town will come to the station. There'll be no padded seats. There'll be no collection. There'll be no tickets. They will just stand there. Where do the poor people congregate mostly? That's right, at stations, railway stations. And then I will speak in the evening, and we'll have that band playing, and we will pray for the sick, and we will see miracles, because God showed me that already. Signs and wonders and miracles always follow the preaching of the gospel. Okay? And then we'll all climb into bed after we've had a good shower and have a nice meal and we'll go to sleep. And the next morning that train will steam out of that town to the next town. Now the same thing will happen. But can you imagine now? People have been healed, born again, marriages restored in the previous town. They're not going to be sitting there. They're going to get in their pickups, their cars, their buses, and they're going to follow the train. And I'm believing for a Holy Ghost revival. So this will be the revival for the man in the street. This will not be for a select group of affluent people or even a select group of poor people. By the way, God is no respecter of persons. I want to tell you, Joseph of Arimathea was the man that took the body of Christ off the cross. He was an extremely wealthy businessman. And Nicodemus was part of the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of Israel. Those two men were responsible for taking the body of Christ off the cross. Not the disciples. They ran away. We're going to get all kinds of people on that train. You see, a lot of people want to preach the gospel, George. But they don't know how to. They want to get in the streets. They want to tell people their story. They want to tell the people how the Lord has saved them. But they don't know how to do it. We are going to give them the, the opportunity to do that. We're going to make a place for them. And they're going to pay for it. How? They're going to pay for their ticket. They're going to pay for their accommodation and their food and the privilege (laughs) of preaching the gospel. And it's going to be a win-win situation. It'll be two-pronged. The one will be to the people in the street and the other will be to the people on the train. Some can come for a week. Some will come for the full month. And that's what's going to happen. That train's going to keep on going until we get to our destination. The hedgerows, the highways, the byways, wherever... The whosoevers, just like what's happened with mighty men, just like what's happened with the stadium events, just, but this time we're going to them. It's going to be amazing. I can't, I can't wait. I want to thank you for watching this video. We love you very much. We've given you an, um, an overview of what's taken place through Shalom Ministries in the year 2020, a year that everybody wants to maybe put behind them, okay? Because many of you watching this program, in the course of this year, you've lost your business, or you've lost your employment, or your children couldn't finish their university education, or maybe you've been through a bad marriage, something, or maybe you've been in hospital with the COVID-19, and maybe you've lost a loved one through it. So it's been a traumatic year to make, to put it, you know, just to put it lightly. But where to from here? Well, I want to say to you, for me, I believe 2021 is going to be the best year we've ever had. Why? Because it's one year closer to seeing the Lord Jesus Christ coming back in all His glory. 
And like never before, and I am a preacher, have I seen people so interested in this book. I have never seen an interest in this book like I am seeing at the moment. That thought for the day. Some people come to me and they say they send in that little thought for the day every morning to unbelievers, people who will not enter the door of a church. And yet if they miss by five minutes, these people are phoning them and saying, where's my thought for the day? We are only talking about the Bible, about Jesus. So I believe that through this thing which the devil has tried to destroy people with, God has turned for good. People are now getting back to basics. They are starting to realize there's more to life than just trying to have a good time. It's about my country. It's about my world. It's about my family. It's about my children. It's about the way forward. People's thoughts are now centered on eternity. People are now talking about eternity. They're not talking so much about here because they've seen how fragile this world actually is. How it can be turned upside down in an instant by a thing called a virus. And so I'm very excited for 2021 and I'm believing God for the greatest revival that the world has ever seen. I've been saying that for some time and I believe we're going to see it and we're going to see it massively all over the world. And it's going to come by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to say to those pastors that are watching this program, Sir, get yourself ready for the biggest infilling and the biggest harvest of souls ever, ever seen before. So what do we need to do in the meantime? We need to get ready. We need to prepare our hearts. We need to repent of our sins. We need to ask Jesus Christ to be Lord of our lives yet once again. After this program, I'm going to pray for you. I'll pray a simple prayer. It's called a salvation prayer. Okay, oh, well, I did that before. But are you serving God today? No. Well, then you need to pray this prayer. See, I pray it often. Okay. Remember, we are in a spiritual war. It's not a physical war. It's a spiritual war. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. And that's what we want to do. We want to pray for you so that you will be ready for this revival. I want to say to you very, very clearly, and excuse what I'm saying, don't lose out on getting your ticket for the train. But I'm not talking about the train in South Africa. I'm talking about the train that's going to heaven. Because if you don't have the ticket, you're not getting on. So just in closing, I want to pray. I want to pray a prayer, a personal prayer, just between you and me and the Lord. Ah, uh, but I'm not into that. You have to be into that. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one's going to the Father but by me. Yeah, but I've always been a good boy. It's got nothing to do with that. It's to do with faith. Not faith in a God, faith in Jesus Christ. So if you'd like to pray this prayer, I'm going to pray this prayer with you. Please pray after me. I'm going to pray very slowly so that you can pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, at the end of this uh, year that's been full of turmoil, say it, I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I have realized, pray it, I have realized, I cannot do it without you. Please come into my heart today. I surrender my life to you and I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. I will follow no other gods but you. And I look forward to the day when you come to take me home to be with you in glory forever. I pray that you'll increase my faith, take away fear, take away anxiety, stress and depression and fill my heart with love and faith and hope so that Lord when you return when we hear the trumpet blowing you'll be able to say with multitudes of other believers come Lord Jesus come I ask this in your precious name Amen well there you are you've prayed the prayer and so may God bless you and I believe hopefully I will see you in the year 2021 but as we always say if I don't see you here I'll see you there why? Because good people don't go to heaven. Believers go to heaven. Goodbye.